Jerry, I want you to pick up, if you will, in addition to the comments I know you're going to make, on a couple of things that Professor Fu said. He talked about a top-down model of governance, which we all are aware of. And he talked about the initial desire of many of the senior leaders towards rule of law, reform, um, but the fact that each inevitably has hit the wall, I think that's the phrase used, and that there's a narrowing window. The, the window of opportunity for reform is actually shrinking rather than expanding in terms of time. If, if that's the environment that we're in right now, um, what are some of the things that you see as potential I want you to talk both about the challenges. What, what are the things that make it more difficult now? And I want you also to talk and focus on what are some of the opportunities? What should we and others be thinking about as opportunities to begin to break out of this cycle of good intention, hitting the wall, a lessening, lessening of space, and time and opportunity for reform? Well, uh, one question is how does change occur that affects human rights and the rule of law in China. Uh, my own view is you need both very substantial push from the bottom and you need leadership at the top. Uh, I have a continuing discussion with our distinguished guest, uh, the blind human rights activist, Chen Guangcheng, who puts all his faith in the growing pressures from the bottom. He thinks that will prevail. And it may well, but not in my lifetime, perhaps in his. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, I think you have to have leadership. Somebody in the top has got to see the time has come for political, legal, human rights reform. Just as former Prime Minister Zhu Rongji saw the need for drastic economic reform in China, including the very difficult job of getting China into the WTO, we need some leader or group of leaders in the Standing Committee of the Politburo who will say, enough of what we've been through, we're entering a new stage, and we have to recognize just the way Chiang Kai-shek's son, Jiang Jinghua, recognized in the mid-80s. He'd been a killer. When I first went to Taiwan, he was notorious secret police head, uh, no Democrat he. But 20 years later, he saw you can't fight change forever. You can't go on repressing people. You have to have institutional reform. And I think he's a neglected figure because although Deng Xiaoping was brilliant on international affairs and economic reform, from my view, Deng remained a Stalinist when it came to political legal matters. He was a repressor. He presided over the anti-rightist movement of 1957 to 59, even though 20 years later he had to rehabilitate a lot of the victims uh, he had put away. Uh, I think China's going to have to have some leader who will say, this is the way I can make my mark in history. This is going to be my contribution. But we don't see those people now. We look to uh, Xi Jinping. I don't see that in him. Um, people thought his predecessor, Hu Jintao, such a nice looking fellow, he must be for reform. Oh, at least in his second term, uh, when he's more secure. Well, second term turned out to be a disaster from the point of view of human rights. And he's still a very nice looking person. Uh, so Hu Jintao, I don't think, I think he's going to be a muddler through. He's going to try to make everybody happy. And uh, I don't think he'll be as bad as Brezhnev, but we may see certain traits that are familiar there. Second fellow, Li Keqiang, we look to because uh, he's a Beijing University Law School graduate, first to be in the Politburo. Uh, he didn't get where he is by fostering human rights and uh, legal development, but you never do in that kind of system. You can't show your true colors until the top. We learned that from Khrushchev in de-Stalinization. We learned that in spades 
And that's why the, so many of the Chinese are conservative from Gorbachev, who'd been to law school, and look what happened. So uh, this is tricky stuff. Where will leadership come from? Maybe Li Keqiang will be helpful. I mean, we have here a leading scholar of Chinese justice who's a contemporary in a way, went to law school in the same period, knows a lot of the players, including the new head of the Supreme Court, uh, Joe Chang. Uh, that's a real improvement. We're watching the personnel changes now. And uh, I just read this morning in preparation for the class this afternoon with Ira Belkin on the court system in China, the importance of individuals still count in China. Uh, Professor Fu's article makes clear it was important that Xiaoyang became the new head of the uh, court system 15 years ago, and he did what he could within the confines of party strictures. And then his successor was a disaster. He presided over uh, the turn from law, to use a phrase that Carl Minzer at Fordham has now uh, popularized. Uh, we witnessed, uh, since 2007, a distinct turn away from legal development. The article that we have for today's class by Professor Fu was written at a time of maximum optimism. It came out about five years ago. And now maybe it's good timing because we're hoping there'll be a return under the new leadership. Leaders count in China. Individuals make a difference. They're not automata. And we are looking now, reading the tea leaves, as it were, trying to provide a little bit of instant China for busy people here to help you uh, interpret what's going on. But leadership, I think, is important. And I don't see yet any real signs, despite improvement in legislation, such as the new criminal procedure law, I don't see anything to suggest there's going to be an important change in the system. Now, where will the sources of change come from, apart from the bubbling up, the ferment in China? Maybe from labor law, or labor problems? Uh, that's one source. That helped to fuel June 4th, 1989 problems. That's why the party got so worried and drastic. But more important, I see the environment. The environment is sort of apolitical. Even though the rich in China and the leadership can afford all these machines for cleaning their domestic air, they still have to go outside occasionally, and their children do. And look at the front page story on today's New York Times. I think this may be a safe awning under which many popular forces can mobilize uh, in support of institutional change. Uh, I don't think it's going to come from just the religious groups who are being suppressed. It's another article today's Times about the most recent condemnation of some religious people as a cult. Uh, I don't think it's going to come from the democracy adv advocates or the human rights people. We need them all. But I think you have to have broader sources of popular momentum. And given the internet and the social media, and given China's terrific problems, most people in the world only see China as a threat because they see all of its remarkable accomplishments. But many of us see China maybe the way the Chinese leaders do. You see all the problems. They're a cat on a hot tin roof, and they know it. And maybe their tendency will be, as it has been in the recent past, simply to pass the problems on to the next guys 10 years down the pike. I hope it's not going to be that way. I'd like to see leaders take the initiative. But we on the outside have some limited role. Our US Asia Law Institute is uh, typical of various agencies that are trying to work with the Chinese and fostering those in the courts and in the procuracy and the legal profession and legal scholarship that are on the right side of this struggle. But we're limited, of course, in what we can do, and the leadership is trying to curb our influence uh, even more. Very similar problems in Russia, of course, and I always want to follow what's going on there because the two are closer than they have been in many years, and they're exchanging 
uh, experiences on how to keep the lid on, even though one is no longer communist in form uh, and the other is communist, if only in form. So it's a complex scene, mixed things. We're making some progress. I think people in China are making some progress. Education is a very important force, interaction with the world. Uh, we mustn't reduce our contacts with China. We have to expand them to the extent we can and still remain honest. And that's what we uh, are trying to do. I don't want to monopolize the talk. We can go on, but uh, I just wanted yeah, to sure set the general tone of where we're at at this point. Once again, we're at a kind of crossroads. That's one of the great cliches. How many times I've written articles saying Chinese law at the crossroads. <laughs> we're at the crossroads again, <laughs> not the barricades. Jerry, before we turn to Felice, I want to ask you two things. One, you did a little bit of Kremlinology or Sinology about who's who in, in the leadership. Are there people that you can think of in the leadership um, who have a global view, who've lived abroad, who kind of think about China's role in the world and are likely to be thinking about China's internal politics and structure in a way that is connected to its relationship with the rest of the world? Well, China vindicates the old Tip O'Neill proposition, foreign policy, uh, all politics really start at home. Uh, I don't know anybody in the top seven, uh, you could say, are very sophisticated about international affairs. Uh, I like uh, Wang Qishan when he was a young Beijing rising bureaucrat. I was in Beijing teaching Chinese officials. Uh, he was intelligent, respectful. He's had a lot of international experience since then on economic matters. Some people think he's been sidetracked now by being put in charge of the party's uh, most recent uh, attempt uh, to suppress corruption uh, instead of running the economy. Uh, that remains to be seen, uh, whether the he can push the anti-corruption view, but I don't know really uh, anybody in the leadership who you could identify as being very sensitive to or experienced in international affairs. And I should say, China has many wonderful diplomats and extremely able international lawyers and veteran participants. Uh, I see Steve Hill here from our US mission. He deals with them every day at the UN. It's not 1979. Uh, when China appointed its first ambassador to the United States, ex-General Wang, I mean, he couldn't speak English. He was, he was just uh, what you'd expect from the debris of the Cultural Revolution, the clever guy, but not a diplomat. Now these are, the new ambassador is a terrific person, Mr. Tsui Tenkai, and uh, at the UN and everywhere. China has wonderful people, but the sad thing is they don't have much influence. They don't really have an impact. The security people, the military people have much more influence on the leadership. But nevertheless, the leaders know you can't neglect international affairs even if they're only secondary. Uh, in your daily considerations. Uh, there are a lot of puzzling things. Uh, also, you have this problem of central government and the local government. Uh, if you want to make things concrete, we're talking very general abstract. I come down to Chen Guangcheng's nephew, uh, who's been locked up. Family is now being persecuted. Death threats on their doorstep just the other day. Uh, a year after Chun's escape. Why does the central government allow this? Why don't they intervene? Do they care they're turning Chun into a dissident? He didn't want to be a dissident. Do they care what it does to their public image? They care, obviously, but not enough to have it overcome other values, such as letting the local people uh, do what they think best and uh, repressing people because they're afraid Chun's supporters, if not suppressed, uh, will create problems by opening up uh, dialogue in the media, etc. It's a very complex situation where foreign policy, international affairs, rank second 